Centers for Social Action Ontario is very pleased to have Sam Schweisberg join us today to discuss the legal implications of Bill 7. Sam is one of those rare people who truly cares about others, which may be why he's chair of the Ontario Caregiver Coalition. Sam received a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Ottawa and a Master of Laws from Osgoode Hall, York University. He teaches law at Carleton University and has been general counsel and corporate secretary for the Canadian Red Cross. The law related to long-term care is of special interest to Sam since his wife has MS and he has been her caregiver since 1994. So thank you, Sam, for providing this informative session today. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm, uh, I'm quite flattered to have been asked to be a speaker today and uh, to have uh, uh, had so many of you uh, be, be interested enough to tune in and listen to me today. So thanks very much for that. Now, um, I just thought I'd let you know that before we get going that I know there may be questions. And so I'll look for them uh, if they pop up on the screen in the chat box and what have you. But as I may be focused on what I'm talking about, what I'll probably do after every three or four or five slides is just uh, make sure that I haven't missed any questions and and address anything that's that's outstanding at that time. So kind of playing it by ear really and, and just fielding questions as they may arise from time to time. Again, pausing at various stages just to address any specific questions I may have missed. So um, without further ado, I guess we can go to the slides. So as you can see, um, I fashioned today's uh, talk somewhat around the title of the bill that became law, uh, More Beds, Better Care, and I posed the question whether in fact uh, people are being diverted into lesser care, and if that is the case, uh, are there any legal considerations that arise? Next. Next. <laughs> I think I see Harry looking at his screen. There we go. All righty. So like all lawyers, of course, I, I, I engage in, in the traditional CYA exercise, which uh, uh, to be polite, I will not uh, spell out what it means, but uh, many of you probably know. Today, my mission is really to raise possible legal issues. I'm not giving legal advice. Uh, specific situations require detailed analysis of, of the facts of a situation. But what I am doing is based on my view of the landscape of the situation as a whole, I'm raising possible legal issues, which I think there's sufficient evidence out there to justify making the inquiries, at least, to see if there's further uh, research uh, that needs to be done, particularly in specific cases where uh, perhaps patients who are in long-term care have experienced uh, bad times in terms of either abuse of staff, which have been reported, or negligent care, those kinds of things. So as I say, uh, this is uh, uh, not legal advice. You always have to go get a lawyer for a specific situation if, if a situation that concerns you arises. And I, of course, make that clear. Always, of course, the details and evidence in a specific situation matter, ma matter the most. So what I'm planning to do here is, uh, is just lay out possible plan for future action as a consequence of the observations I'm making today, uh, because I think that's an important element of the exercise. It's always nice to talk about things, but it's even better to actually do something about them once you've identified them. So next, please. So just a bit of a contextual overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm first going to um, touch very briefly on the, the, the notion that there's generational friction out there and anything we decide to do collectively as a group or individually, we always try, I think, we try to avoid generational friction, which is quite prevalent in today's society. And I'll touch on that a bit more. And then I'm going to make some observations about the, uh, the legislation that we're talking about, Bill 7 today, in terms of economics. And Forgive me, but I I, uh, I do I have always enjoyed economics. I know it's hard to believe that somebody actually enjoys economics, but I did minor in it. So I'm going to give you a few observations from my position as an amateur economist. But I'm also going to do so because 
it has implications for the first area of law I'm going to want to talk about, which is competition law, otherwise known as antitrust law. And then I'm going to start getting into a bit of the history of long-term care in Ontario, particularly uh, touch upon a couple of the uh, public inquiries that, that have been held on the subject, uh, in particular, the wet law for matter. And I'll tell you more about that once we get into it, as well as the military report that came out of their involvement in long-term care homes during the COVID tragedy and the resulting independent commission and what they those uh, parties had to say about long-term care in Ontario, because it is very, very relevant to the, uh, the legal situation and the questions and the legal issues I'm going to be raising. And then we're going to, after making those generalized observations, get into certain areas of law, which I think are quite relevant to uh, the current situation on Ontario vis-a-vis -vis long term care. Negligence law, is it potentially applicable to much of what's going on in Ontario? Administrative law, are there tools in administrative law available to both patients and their caregivers to deal with uh, situations where perhaps the government isn't enforcing laws that are on the books? Indeed, there are even contract law issues I'm gonna to touch upon. And saving it for last, because it's the first thing that comes to mind, is human rights law. Are there human rights issues arising from the way Bill 7 is being uh, legislated and applied? Next, please. So let's talk a little bit about generational tension, because that's something we all want to avoid. If we've been reading the newspapers or attending to social media, we know that there's a bit of a generational issue that has arisen as there always is. I mean, it seems that this, this is not unusual. Uh, and of course, some of those issues include the boomer debt legacy. Governments are, uh, are not in surplus. In fact, they're in deficit. And there's a lot of generational talk about uh, from millennials and Zoomers that we've left them with a, a legacy of debt and that uh, the boomers are somehow to, to blame for that. Uh, that's exacerbated by the fact that uh, the current uh, young generations, the millennials and Gen Zs, they're of course having challenging housing issues, what with the cost of housing going up. That's also a point of friction. There's some uh, suggestion in some quarters that that's perhaps related to the fact that debt has increased considerably while we were young, and that's raising interest rates now, which of course is having an impact on housing. The fact that CPP is potentially, Canada Pension Plan is potentially uh, underfunded and concerns that there won't be a CPP for younger people in the future. Uh, also, climate change is another sore point uh, with the young in particular, with a view that perhaps uh, we boomers squandered an opportunity to do more about this uh, before it got quite so bad. And all these things really stoke generational friction to a point. I don't want to overstate it. I, th I think sometimes these things are overstated in the media because, you know, that sells papers and sells digitized uh, information. Uh, but having said that, uh, it does exist. And if any legal tools are going to be utilized in the future to deal with either Bill 7 or the broader long-term care situation in Ontario, I think it is important that we position these tools or use these tools in a fashion that unites people as opposed to dividing them generationally. And that means ensuring that we also, in, in the use of such tools, represent more youthful caregivers with their struggles, as well as the elderly and disabled. Because let's not forget, uh, many, many people, of course, are, are cared for in the, when they're more elderly or if they're disabled by relatives, by family, for no money. And these caregivers have a very, important stake in what happens in the future with this legislation. And they're, they're impacted, uh, not quite as much, but certainly to a large degree by, by Bill 7 and by, uh, and by the long-term care situation in Ontario. So to me, and as, as, as the chair of the Ontario Caregivers Coalition, which is an advocacy group for, for care, caregivers, I do think that if legal tools are going to be used in the future, that they're used in a fashion that represents the cumulative uh, frustrations of all of us. Next, please. So let's talk about economics just a bit, but 
let's hopefully do it in something of a slightly entertaining fashion. You know, as I was growing up and going to, to, uh, to McGill University where I got my BA and learning about economics, one of the first lessons I always got that was that, hey, capitalism works very well. And the reason capitalism works very well is because free markets allocate resources efficiently, more so than command economies. Uh, it reminds me of the old story of, uh, which I was taught, I think at McGill, where in a command economy, if a factory gets a quota to make a million tons of nails in a given year, it may very well make one one million ton nail because that'll satisfy the quota, even though nobody wants to buy a one million ton nail. And that's the problem with the command economy. When you set quotas for manufacturers and what have you, those quotas don't translate into what consumers actually need. And so consumers, through the exercise of their choice, by buying what they want and not buying what they don't want, actually uh, regulate the marketplace to require manufacturers to produce what consumers want so that the resources are most efficiently allocated, which makes all of us richer because if resources are allocated uh, properly and appropriately and efficiently, that means that society as a whole builds wealth. And of course, you know, the, the idea behind a free market system is that the law of supply and demand um, operates. Uh, and the result of that is that the market is self-regulated, but, and you may have all heard of him, Adam Smith called the invisible hand. There's an invisible hand when supply meets demand that creates an equilibrium that distributes resources efficiently. And what first struck me as somebody who's not particularly left wing and not particularly right wing, kind of a centrist, and therefore a really a believer in, in, in the market system as a whole. Uh, what and not I'm really not a socialist, although sometimes you need a little bit of socialism. But the bottom line is that Bill 7 denies consumers choice. If it denies consumers choice, you're distorting the market economy. And therefore, you're not allocating resources efficiently. So that struck me actually as something of a rather unfree market approach, particularly coming, and I wax a little political here from a conservative government, which is supposed to believe in free market choice. So really, you can criticize this from both ends of the political spectrum, Bill 7. You can criticize it on the basis of the fact that you really don't believe for profits should have a role to play in in the allocation of uh, long-term care in Ontario, and you may be critical of it in that way, but even if you're a believer in free markets and you think it's okay for for-profit corporations to be in the business, it's still a bad piece of legislation because it really doesn't let a free market operate. And therefore you're producing goods potentially for consumers that consumers don't want. And so you don't have the regulation of a free market system on uh, long-term care in Ontario when you're forcing people to send uh, their relatives or making the, the sick people themselves decide to go into an institution because they're being told to by a hospital. Next, please. So why am I talking about economics apart from the fact that I think it might be bad policy because this is supposed to be a talk about uh, law. And the reason I raise it is because of the possible applicability of the Competition Act, which uh, in the United States is, is called antitrust law. Uh, so the idea behind competition legislation is to promote competition in the marketplace and to promote uh, the protection of free markets so that you know a free market does in fact allocate resources efficiently. And there are all kinds of rules in the Competition Act about you know, laws against price fixing and laws against collusion among uh, parties that are supposed to be in competition in a way that, 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 that doesn't let the market operate as it should. Uh, and now I, I hasten to add, I am not an expert in competition law. This is an extremely specialized area of law and really people who practice in this area of law do almost nothing else. But I do know enough about it to spot potential issues. And I lay some of these out in my slide. I'm not saying that this evidence exists, but I think there's enough out there to ask the question whether there is in fact any evidence to suggest that an oligopoly operates in Ontario 
that engages in anti-competitive behaviors in the long-term care market? Is there evidence out there? I'm asking the question, I'm not giving the answer. Is there any evidence to suggest that Bill 7 curtails consumer choice in a way that operates to prevent a free market from working properly? And does it do so in a manner that is not in compliance with the objectives of the Composition Act? And if so, is this a proper exercise of provincial power? Again, asking questions, not giving answers. Is there any evidence of any kind whatsoever to suggest links between the primary long-term care operators of Ontario and the current government to raise a potential case of collusion? I won't go into the details, but there's some evidence that premiers of the past have in fact got significant roles with some of the biggest caregiver providers, uh, long-term caregiver providers in Ontario. So does that, is there more to it than that? Because if it's, there's only that, that's not enough. But certainly it raises the question as to whether we should look, be looking into the possibility of there being more evidence of possible collusion. And finally, based on all this, is there enough evidence and enough reason here to engage a specialist in competition law to explore these issues further, to see if, in fact, maybe uh, there are some activities that are, be, that are being undertaken in Ontario that are, in fact, non-compliant with the Competition Act. Next slide, please. Now, we move from the economic to the basically the, the political and legal. And to understand whether tort law has a role to play in certain cases where patients have, have, okay, have, have been caused harm in a long-term care home, to, to, to inquire as to whether administrative legal tools are available, administrative law legal tools are available in certain situations to deal with perhaps what one what, what might call lack of action on the part of the provincial government, we need to look at history a little bit. And I think we don't have to go very far back, although this has been going on a long time. We only have to go back to, uh, to 2019 and look at the findings of, of the wet law for public inquiry. Now, probably most of you have heard about this, but in case any of you have not, just a very uh, brief uh, introduction to what happened there is this nurse who was working in long-term care, in fact, was a serial health killer. And she was convicted, her name was Wetlawfer, of course, hence the name of the inquiry. She was convicted of eight counts of first degree murder, four counts of attempted murder. And what she was doing is she was administering insulin overdoses to patients in long-term care homes. Uh, and she was convicted of that. In, effect, in fact, there were actually some other aggravated assault charges as well on top of that. And this was, of, of course, very tragic and it had been happening over a period of time. So the government felt, and rightly so, I think, that a public inquiry into this should be held. And its findings were released on July 31st, 2019. Now, the commissioner noted that Although the inquiry was not tasked with conducting a general review of the long-term care system, certain questions relevant to it had to be raised. And to a certain extent, she did in fact look at the long-term care system in Ontario. And one of her findings, for example, was that these murders would not have been discovered if the nurse had not confessed, which is kind of a scary thought. They could have kept on going and going and going and nobody would have, would have known about it. And further, she concluded that the murders were the result of systemic vulnerabilities and that the system, the long-term care system, she meant, was strained but not broken. Strained but not broken were her, were her words. And when you read the, 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 the findings as a whole, you see that she's trying to build a consensus for action here. So she's trying not to be overly confrontational. She's trying to build a collaborative uh, approach to things where government and, and all players will, 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 will cooperate. Now, uh, next slide, please. I think at the end of my description of what the findings were, we'll, we'll see if there are any questions out there. She also said in her findings, the commissioner did, that the Long-Term Care Homes Act creates, and I find this very interesting, a solid regulatory framework for resident-centered care. The standards are clear. There is on paper a rigorous inspection re regime. There is on paper, or there are on paper, minimum standards of care. 
there are on paper reporting requirements. On paper, again, uh, requirements for medication management, infection control, food safety, quality of service, and staffing, in particular training of staffing. But then she says in one of her other recommendations that the ministry should review the performance results to identify long-term care homes struggling to provide a safe and secure environment. So if you read between the lines there, she's saying there are out there long-term care homes that are struggling to meet these standards. So if we have on the one hand, high standards that are supposed to be enforced by a regulator, and on the other hand, uh, homes that are struggling to meet those standards, and apparently this is ongoing for some time, something is amiss. And that really raises legal questions, as you'll see. It raises questions as to whether parties and long-term care homes are falling below what lawyers call a reasonable standard of care, which if they are, could give rise to negligence claims. And it also raises the question as to whether uh, governments are in fact properly enforcing their standards which gives rise possibility to administrative law tools, such as getting a writ of mandamus, which is a court order requiring uh, a long-term care home and the ministry in particular to fulfill its regulatory duties and do what it's supposed to be doing on paper if it's not meeting its own paper requirements. And clearly this was happening uh, at the time of the public inquiry findings because as as the commissioner says, when a home is found to be non-compliant, the next quality inspection should be at the most intense level. In fact, she went on to say that staff need more screening and more background checks, which, which are already were already regulatory requirements. And finally, there can be no excellence in care without first meeting regulatory standards. So if you could go to the next slide, I'll, I think I'll stop here for any questions that might be out there because I've seen things popping on the bottom of my screen that I haven't addressed. So uh, perhaps the way to do it is to have um, um, one of you uh, field the, um, uh, the questions and, and, and say them out loud so we can all deal with them orally. Yes, hi, Sam. Um, it looks to me like Andrew, Andrew McNamara, you've got a question about the vulnerabilities. Maybe you could say it out loud. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. So I was just, um, if you could just briefly, if possible, just, just quickly list what the vulnerabilities were based on uh, on the report. Oh, well, basically, um, if you go to the previous slide. Well, actually, you know what? Let's, sorry, sorry, I should have. Let's stay at the same slide because I think we're going to see them in the next slide. Uh, Thank you. Um, I, yeah. Well, basically, they were all kinds of vulnerable. There we go. If you look at the military report, which followed the uh, the commission just just uh, you know nine or ten months later, uh, the military, which went into the homes, the COVID, uh, the long term homes during the COVID crisis, found uh, that patients were allowed to wander with the use of unsterile hydration equipment such as catheters, inadequate dosing and palliative care, a culture of fear to use supplies because they cost money use of expired medication, uh, new staff were not trained, doctors weren't available, staff were burned out with low morale, it was impossible to provide care appropriately, abusive staff behavior, lack of charting, and a lack of so psychosocial report or wellness checks, cockroaches and other insect infestations, those are just a few. So there's a litany of problems. Now, granted, these were probably the five worst homes in Ontario at the time, because the government, to its credit, did call in the military into these homes uh, at a time uh, of, of crisis during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, and these findings were made. So I'm not suggesting that every single home has these problems, but there were certainly a significant number that extremely serious uh, number, and those are some of the vulnerabilities. Those are more than vulnerabilities. Those are actual standards of care that are well below what are being mandated on a regulatory basis. Any other questions? I see something at the bottom uh, from Trish to everyone. Oh, that's from you, Trish. <laughs> 
So that's it for in terms of questions. Yes, I was just actually I was just saying that um, Seniors for Social Action Ontario has a letter from the Ministry of Health saying that they have no means of tracking when staffing falls below 80 percent. And they also have no means of tracking whether or not physicians are visiting facilities. And they said they have a policy that no one is to be admitted to a facility um, uh, that is in a COVID outbreak. And yet we know of people who have been admitted when there's a COVID outbreak. So that's a violation of their policy. Apparently, um, the ministry was unaware of that. And unless you make a complaint, they don't investigate it. So um, Peter has asked uh, a question here, Sam. Were these homes private versus for profit and what numbers and percentages of comparison? Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I'm not sure if it wouldn't be it wouldn't be um, relevant from a legal perspective. It may be relevant from a policy perspective. Don't get me wrong, but it, it's not uh, relevant from a legal perspective because let's say um, I, I'm a patient in one of these long term care homes and I have suffered a harm as a consequence of being bullied or beaten by a staff member or forced to to uh, stay in my own uh, uh, urine because I'm not being properly changed frequently enough. Well, you know, any I'm a victim of some kind of neglect. And the word neglect was used by the, uh, the Minister of Long-Term Care before the public inquiry, uh, one of the public inquiries. So I'm a victim of neglect. As an individual, do I have legal recourse? And the question of whether I have legal recourse depends on whether a, a tort has been committed in that instance. Was I intentionally abused by a staff member, in which case a home might be vicariously liable? Or was I the subject of neglect, in which case there may be a negligence suit, because when an institution and its staff falls below a reasonable standard of care, that is considered to be negligent. Clearly, a duty of care is owed to me as a patient there, and clearly a reasonable person in the street would think that is below a reasonable standard of care. And Quite frankly, when there's a regulatory regime in existence, that establishes what the reasonable uh, level of care should be. And if you fall below the regulatory level, you probably fall below the, the, the negligence level too. So in that situation as a, as, a, as a patient, it doesn't matter to me if it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit that's done that. I have a legal case against that, that legal home that, that long-term care home, if I can prove on evidence that these things happened, and if I can prove on evidence on a balance of probabilities that I was harmed by it. So it, it doesn't matter from a legal perspective, but of course I appreciate that it could matter from a policy perspective, depending on your point of view and what the numbers say. I don't know, maybe Trish has some numbers there that uh, she can share. No? All right, so um, if we could go back to uh, the, the slide before, because I think that's where we were at. Uh, maybe one, one more back, uh, the previous one before that, because I'm not sure I quite finished with that one. Right, so uh, what, the, um, what, what the commissioner found was that um, staff definitely needed more screening and more background checks. And as she said, there can be no excellence of care without first meeting regulatory standards. So I just wanted to add to that. And there can be no reasonable standard of care, I would argue, without first meeting regulatory standards. Next, please. So the government of Ontario had a response and it came out on July 30th, 2020, in the midst of COVID and basically just about on the anniversary date of the release of the findings. And uh, what the uh, government of Ontario had to say was that uh, the commissioner's recommendations, and by the way, the commissioner was both a Rhodes Scholar, an Ontario Court of Appeal judge, and a uh, graduate of Oxford University, so clearly no slouch. Uh, what, the, what the government said was that 80% of the commissioner's recommendations are completed or underway, she said. Um, so I'd like to know from, from a perspective of, uh, uh, of a consumer out there, and perhaps not so much as an employee, out of that 80%, what part of those were completed and what part of those were still underway? <laughs> that's, that's a question I had. 
at the time uh, when I saw that statement. Uh, she said, we, have, we know we have more to do. We will continue to make progress on these important recommendations. And then she says, in order to fully address the systemic issues facing our long-term care system, the province needs to act on the additional concerns that, it, that have been highlighted during this pandemic. And as a consequence of that, they established an independent inquiry commission to look into the, how the COVID um, tragedy unfolded in long-term care homes. But I think it's important to note the dates here because dates are important. July, 2019, we've got some serious issues being identified by a public inquiry. About a year later, we've got a government that says that 80% of the situation has been fixed or is in the process of being fixed. But at the same time, we have an independent commission being called to look into the tragedy of COVID as it's unfolding in the long-term care system in Ontario. Next slide, please. Sam, can I interject just for a sec? I just sure. want to apologize because my computer went down, so I didn't hear anything. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the for profit but, or not for profit? But I'm back now. I just wanted to say um, the CBC did find 85% of facilities out of compliance with the Act. So that's the vast majority. Um, and also, I think it was Dr. Stahl and several other doctors, to answer Peter's question, found that the majority of, of facilities that had the highest numbers of deaths, and this has actually been documented also in a number of other reports, um, that it was the for-profit facilities that were, were primarily the ones um, who had a far higher death rate and significant uh, infection control issues. So just to answer that question, there there is information out there on that. Well, thanks, Trish. Now I will play devil's advocate a little bit. 85% uh, non-compliant, there's, there's non-compliance and then there's non-compliance, right? There's minor stuff, which maybe doesn't count so much. And then there's major stuff. So it's always good to know what percentage of the 85% was the really serious stuff and, and what percentage of it was, you know, not keeping proper books or whatever, you know. Uh, and then uh, to, to understand the for-profit, not-for-profit ratio, you have to compare that to what percentage of patients are actually being cared for, not profit, not for profit, vis-a-vis -vis for profit, just to make, you know, fair assessments as to what those statistics mean. But, you know, those statistics are, are, are nonetheless interesting and certainly worth further investigation, of course. So now we're back to the military, unless there are more questions before I go on. Andre is asking, my understanding that legislation put in place during the pandemic protects the long-term care homes from negligence lawsuits. Is that protection still in place? And if so, uh, there are, is there a basis to sue the government instead because they're charged with regulating and monitoring the homes? The government actually didn't prevent lawsuits. They just raised the bar to gross negligence from negligence. Um, but uh, Sam, you probably have some comments there. Yes. Uh, now, gross negligence is a higher standard, but it's not it's not quite as high as negligence. So let's deal with that, first of all. Um, there's a there's a U.S. judge who once said the difference, which I love this, actually, the difference between gross negligence and negligence is the difference between, between a fool and a goddamn fool. I always thought that was kind of a funny way of putting it. So gross negligence is, is negligence that's even worse than regular negligence, to put it bluntly. So it's not a complete bar. It's just makes the case that much harder. It's true. And the next question, of course, is can you sue the government for passing a, a, a bad public policy? Let's say you disagree with it. Unfortunately, the answer is generally no. But, and this is the point I'm going to get to later on, <clears throat> that doesn't mean you can't force the government to do what, what it's supposed to do, which is to actually enforce the regulations it has in place. And that's when we get into the question of administrative law and going to the courts and asking the superior court which is for a writ of mandamus, which is an order requiring a government to fulfill a public duty. It has really created for itself by creating a legislative and regulatory regime it's supposed to be enforcing. So in that sense, you're not really suing for damages, but at least you're getting the government to do what it's supposed to do, notwithstanding the creation of a, um, a, a high bar to protect long-term care homes from negligence. Next slide, please.
So following the, um, the sad, that's the only word I can use for it, the very sad uh, report that came from the military's uh, support of these five homes that were in fact struggling, uh, came uh, the final report of the commission that was established to look into the matter. And that comes out April 30th, 2021. So we're looking, you know, once again, if you look at these timelines, the key timeline, July, 2019, um, July, 2020, and now April, 2021, all this coming in very close order, uh, really not much time um, uh, between these various events. So what, and I'm quoting right out of the report, Ontario's legislative promise to long-term care residents is to provide residences that are a safe, comfortable, home-like environment that support a high quality of life. Where legislative standards are not met or the safety, security, or rights of residents are compromised, the legislation further mandates that corrective action is to be taken. There is a, a summary provided by, once again, another eminent lawyer who headed the commission, indicating that corrective action isn't really being taken when it's supposed to be taken. Now, once again, if you're, if you're in a situation where you have, let's say, a relative or you are a patient in a long-term care home that's not meeting these, uh, these, uh, the, the, the standards and the government isn't doing anything, it always has to be based on the evidence in a particular case, and you'd have to present that in order to go to court to get a writ of mandamus against a particular, with respect to a particular long-term care home that's not being properly uh, regulated by the ministry. But if you can establish that on an evidentiary basis, you should be able to get a writ of mandamus uh, moving forward. So this broad statement here seems to support the notion that there are clearly instances out there somewhere where the government isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing and could be forced to do so through the tools of administrative law. The commission also concluded that Ontario was not prepared for a pandemic. The province's long-term care homes have been neglected for decades by successive governments. And I find this the most interesting element of it. The minister at the time, Dr. Marilee Fullerton said that uh, she used the term neglected to describe both the long-term care sector and its population. Now, was the neglect purely neglect or gross neglect, so to speak? That's something that's open to question, but given the gravity of some of the uh, situations, it could very well be that gross negligence could be proven uh, in some of these homes for some of these people. Uh, another finding was that the pandemic exposed significant short -term shortcomings with enforcement, which did little to ensure adequate infection prevention and control. Um, so clear, clearly, again, there's a, there's a finding here of uh, inadequate enforcement. And I think once again, that raises the, the issue of administrative legal tools. Uh, and this, this is a good segue to the remaining four issues because now we have a sense of what recent history had to say about the, the system as a whole uh, based on the findings of two public inquiries and one military report. Next slide and happy to stop for more questions here, if any. None right now, Sam. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Here we are, we're at the next slide. So what is negligence? Well, one is said to be negligent if you fall below a reasonable standard of care. That's pretty, pretty common sense, really. And if that falling below a reasonable standard of care causes an error or, om or omission that causes harm to another party, well, you may have a case of negligence, of liability on the part of the, uh, the party that committed the error or omission, provided that there's a duty of care owed to the person who suffered the harm. And the remedy is, is damages. And that standard of care of what a reasonable standard of care is, is really all about what the reasonable person would do in like circumstances. So it's an objective test, as the courts like to say, and it's one where you simply have to assess whether an error or omission fell below what a reasonable person would have done in like circumstances. So if you are in a situation where a home has uh, um, caused a harm uh, to a patient, then the next question is, okay, was, was the harm caused 
either, first of all, either uh, intentionally, and when I say intentionally, we're thinking of situations of abuse where a staff member has abused a person, which is not negligence, and therefore the bar of gross negligence would not apply because that's an intentional tort for which the home could be vicariously liable. And secondly, um, uh, the other element is, is whether once you've proven that, that a, a harm uh, has been caused, if you can prove that, uh, if it's unintentional, uh, was the error or omission one that fell below a reasonable standard of care? And in the case of gross negligence, it has to be one that is even worse than falling below a reasonable standard of care. As I said, as <clears throat> that U.S. judge put it so um, brutally, if somebody has been a fool or a goddamn fool, that's really the distinction between negligence and gross negligence. And if you can establish that in an individual case, you very may well have a successful lawsuit, even if the bar has been raised to gross negligence. Now, here's the bad news, though. The general rule is that one cannot sue a government for negligence in the exercise of public policy, but only for operational errors. So if a government passes what you think is a bad policy, that's, that's not a, a, a suable action. However, it's when the, a government or any of its arms or agents does something operationally that neglig that's negligent in the conduct of the policy, well, then you may have a case of negligence against the government as well. So you could conceivably argue that where a government has failed to maintain a regulatory standard of care, which they've put on the books, and it's long-standing, and then a patient suffers harm uh, at the hands of a long-term care home that was negligent, you might be able to also sue the government on the basis of the fact that it was also negligent in not enforcing its regula regulations properly. So there could be a case for uh, liability there because operationally, the government has failed to enforce its own regulations. So they may be jointly negligent with the long-term care home. Again, this all turns on proving uh, on a balance of probabilities, not beyond reasonable doubt, but that's criminal. But on a balance of probabilities, you have to prove the facts that establish the error or omission, prove the facts that the government in this particular case has not enforced its regulation and, and to a point where they themselves have been negligent. And once you can prove those facts and as well as the resulting harm with evidence or a medical opinion, then you have a case uh, of potential liability on the part of both the long-term care home and the government. So that's how it would have to be approached. I see questions popping up, I think. So maybe yeah, and, and Sam, we can go to the next to, slide. Just and then, to let you know, Sam, we've got about 15 minutes. Okay. Well, we're, we don't have much longer because that was the that was the meaty part. <laughs> um, so let's take one or two questions if there are any. Are there any out there? I don't think they're questions. I think they're comments. They're comments. Okay, next slide. So basically, if you read this slide on your own, it raises all kinds of questions. Uh, you ask yourself, how much real progress has been made between the time, uh, during the entire continuum of these uh, various public inquiries? Did the government really make a whole lot of headway in terms of addressing all of these issues which were identified? And if the answer to these questions is not much or even not enough, are hospitals potentially liable as well for referring people to institutions that fall below a reasonable standard of care, particularly if they know these hospitals that, uh, that, that, that these long-term care homes to which they're giving the referrals have fallen below a reasonable standard of care and are not compliant in a regulatory fashion? And finally, is there enough sufficient ground among multiple patients to ground even class action litigation? Next slide, please. Uh, I'm asking the same questions again. Is the government operationally negligent if it fails to meet a self-imposed standard of exercising sufficient regulatory oversight to provide a safe, comfortable, home-like environment? Basically, a point I made earlier. Can the hospital pressure diversion of patients in specific cases where LTC, long-term care, is arguably a negligent choice, can it give rise to a claim grounded in operational decision-making on the part of the hospital when harm arises. 
And is the case against the hospital even stronger uh, if the hospital knows that that particular long-term care home is not meeting regulatory standards? And finally, is the government complicit in its operational decision uh, by having a mandatory policy while at the same time not enforcing its regulatory regime? Next slide, please. And we've touched on this already, so I can really go through this quickly, but if the government and the evidence shows that in a particular case, the regulatory regime is not being enforced, well, in that case, um, is there a case to be made that a writ of mandamus should be granted to an applicant? And in order to get one, you must, you must be able to show that there's a public legal duty to act which I think the regulations themselves would, would show, that the duty must be owed to the applicant, who would presumably be a patient or their caregiver, and is there a clear right to performance of that duty? If you meet those three uh, bars or those three standards or tests, well, then you might have a good case to get rid of mandamus in a particular case. And, and the other questions I ask are, are there currently cases where certain facilities continue to be inadequately inspected or non-compliant with regulations for too long? Could a writ of mandamus be sought to compel the ministry to comply with its legal duties to act? Next slide, please. I'm going to make this one short because we're running out of time, but there's an old case called Lloyds Bank versus Bundy, where a gentleman was basically cajoled by a bank to guaranteeing his son's liability. They preyed upon his emotions. The deal was not fair. And they basically used undue influence and coercion through emotional manipulation to get him to guarantee his son's indebtedness. And, and he got nothing out of the deal. And then they took the bank wanted to take his farm uh, because he had secured the guarantee with his farm. And the, and the court held, actually it was the House of Lords held that that was not enforceable because um, it was an unconscionable tra transaction and undue influence had been exercised on the father. So when you look at the scenario that can be unfolding, could be, this is somewhat speculative, in hospitals where a caregiver, or in fact a patient who's already sick, is being directed to enter a contract with a long-term care home and then has regrets afterwards, could this body of law and argument be used to extricate the patient from the from the bargain from the contract if they decide they don't want to do that it was a mistake and, and they want to come home and perhaps get tended to by a family caregiver always a tough sell in front of a judge but still an argument to be made next slide please i'm not going to dwell on this because this is the area of law that everybody knows about uh is there discrimination against the elderly and the disabled as a consequence of Bill 7? Are there in, in, infringements of the Ontario Human Rights Code or the Charter of Rights and Freedom? And particularly Section 7, which gives everyone the right to the security of the person, um, is security of the person being obliterated or at least <laughs> undermined uh, when one is forcibly, and I use the term very broadly, financially. Uh, urged, if you will, uh, into a, a, a contract with a long-term care home uh, where regulatory uh, standards aren't being met. I suspect that, you know, an argument could be made that, that is in fact the case. Next slide, please. Now, the government said they, by the, as the title of the legislation suggests, that the Fixing Long-Term Care Act fixed the situation and that as a consequence of these amendments, uh, it would make sense to pass Bill 7 because, okay, we fixed it, so now we can start sending people along to these uh, long-term care homes. And I guess the question really is, well, did the law actually address the weaknesses sufficiently, and therefore, is the bill justifiable? That's the only point I'm making with that slide. Uh, next one, please. So what can we do about this? Is there something to be done? Well, I would like to try with the help of this organization and others to gather expertise among lawyers uh, within these discrete areas of law. And I'd like to see if these experts, because I'm something of a generalist, 
do these experts agree that there's something to be looked at here further and investigated further? And if the answer is yes, then develop an intake process to consider individual cases. That would also require a funding model because I know lawyers do have to make a living, although many people think they're wealthy, which is not always the case. Um, but certainly it could be combined with pro bono work. I wonder if legal aid could be made available, something to be looked at. And last but not least, uh, we would have to find affected individuals prepared to be representative plaintiffs, potentially in class action litigation, for which there are other funding tools, if appropriate, I don't know if that would be the case or not, or litigate individually, again, if appropriate, if the evidence in any individual case justified considering this option. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and thought provoking. And uh, I think we probably have a few more minutes for any remaining questions. Um, Ina, is it Ina? Uh, Pearlston has her hand up. Okay. Ina, you're muted. There you go. There we go. Thank you for um, letting me ask this question. It was my understanding that there's been a lawsuit already started against the provincial government regarding some of this that um, Goldblatt Partners has already submit paperwork on. I had heard there was going to be a charter challenge. Yeah, the I charter challenge. I don't know where that stands, to be honest. And my understanding is that they did file papers several weeks ago. Oh, well, that's good. That's once that's a start. Yeah, so so that that's one good thing. And I also wanted to say that in terms of inspection reports for long-term care, um last year, about a year, year and a half ago, my sister was no longer able to stay in her own apartment. She needed to go to long-term care. And my other sister and I looked at the inspection reports that you can find for all the not-for-profit and for-profit long-term cares um, in the vicinity, you know, of the city of Toronto. And there are a lot of violations and nothing seems to be done about them. And I don't think that's changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it was shocking some of the things that we read in the in the in the documentation that we uncovered. So that yeah. suggests that the situation has not been fixed by the. the no, it has not been fixed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm not entirely surprised, but. Yeah, we were fortunate when when my mother had to go to long term care that she went to a really good one and um that did not have those problems and mm -hmm. um and was overseen by north Air general hospital mm -hmm. no no it's it's um in toronto it's called seniors health center and it's actually owned by north Air general hospital and overseen by them so i think that made it a better long-term care because we didn't see any of these sorts of things happening in where my mother was having her care mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I think it's nice to know there are some good ones. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, recommended it recently to a friend of mine, and she's made an appointment to go look look at it. Okay, so, be be careful and and in your tour, we have had members report report to us that they have had real difficulty, and they're in a fight with the inspection branch about that facility right now. <laughs> really, so, that's interesting. Yeah, so, because... so have a very good, careful look. Is is my best advice. Well, my mother was there. Um, and passed away in that facility in 2020. Okay. So yeah, it's possible things have changed since then. Yeah, yeah. But it's, we always yeah. found it was good because it had the oversight from the hospital as well. Yeah, if take a look at who's on the board of that hospital right now. <laughs> oh, okay. So if there's just, been changes, for, then that's different. Yeah, um, oh, I'll have a look. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. There's a question from Andre. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're receiving ALC in a hospital, if you're an alternate level care patient in a hospital and are being forced into a long-term care home that you do not want to go to, do you think that either the negligence arguments or the discrimination arguments could be used to fight the transfer? Many of the arguments you cited seem more appropriate for problems that surface after the fact. Um. 
That's that's a very interesting question. Um, if you it, if you know that the home that the person is being diverted to, uh, I, well, let's, let me ask a question. In this particular, this is, is this a real case situation? Andre, uh, Andre? no, it's not. I, it's hypothetical. Okay. All right. Well. If I were a lawyer advising in that situation, I might want to think about uh, an injunction. An injunction, of course, is an order to, to stop doing something. Um, so I'd want to be able to prove uh, on a balance of convenience, because that's the language they use when you're trying to get an injunctive, that the specific uh, home in question is, is not being properly regulated, that it's not a safe place, and that as a consequence of that, in this specific case, to put that person there would put them in danger of harm. And that the balance of convenience therefore favors the patient not going, and that based on a, a, a charter argument uh, that the legislation is invalid because it, it, it places the security of the person at risk, and perhaps some other arguments along human rights uh, lines, that I should be granted that injunction. So that's definitely a, a potential area for uh, discussion and for action. But it would have to be coupled with uh, some kind of a charter argument because in that case you need to strike down the the uh, the law which is you know give, gives the hospital the right to do this. Okay. And maybe if I may if I can just ask a supplementary question the um, is this the kind of thing though you're trying to um, uh, um, find I guess in in the um, in the a couple of slides ago, you talked about case, court cases that you were trying to kind of pull together. Is this the kind of thing that you're trying to to find in order to to uh, to fight the um, the bill seven? Well, there's already been a court case out there that could help that with a judge's decision. Uh, of course, that would be very helpful. We know we know you know in Nova Scotia uh, there was a case that was favorable to to patients decided along human rights laws. So. That's a case that could be used as a precedent uh, if you were trying to get an injunction to stop the transfer. Yep. Okay, I'm going to move to the next. There's two questions. Um, Sal Amenta has a question. Sal? Don't know if he's there. Okay, I'm gonna jump to Sue Mikulasek. I hope I'm not murdering your name, Sue. Well, that's okay, Trish. That's Trish talking, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Trish. Um, so I was uh, just going to describe what uh, what happened with my mother uh, when she was in hospital awaiting long-term care and had had an application in for a long time, um, several years um, prior to that. Uh, well, we cared for her in the community as long as was possible. And interestingly, she was in care just as Bill 7 was in hospital, just as Bill 7 was coming out. And in conjunction with advice from uh, Jane at the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, what we ended up doing was we put her files into a lockbox so that the neither the hospital nor the um, Home and Community, uh, HCACSS or whatever it's called now, um, could forward her records without her consent to any homes that were not of her choosing. And interestingly, you know, she was in hospital for several for months waiting for her long term care. And interestingly, within days of us doing that, magically, the home that she had been an applicant for became available and off she went. So I, I almost got the impression that people were trying to make sure to avoid the fights and where patients are looking at means to try to um, move things forward in a, in a way that might um, per, seem contentious or potentially Legis uh, taken into the courts that they did not want to, to go fight there. those kind of cases. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, to your point about finding people who are willing to be the 
the candidates for these, it, we were we were working with um, ACE at that time with sort of that in mind that you know we're willing to be the the guinea pig here around this, and that uh, people are avoiding that happening. The, the squeak. From what the, I can see. Sorry, I thought you were, the, the squeaky wheel gets greased, right? Um, you're right. They want to avoid these scenarios if they can, because on top of that, you can imagine the press would be interested in a case like that too. So there's no doubt the squeaky wheel gets greased. My only question was, I was wondering, uh, the hospital already has medical records, so couldn't they just use that to justify the transfer? I'm not sure what you were- No, the, the hospital has to, so the way that Bill 7 works is that the hospital has to send an application with your medical information to the home. The right. home has to accept you, and then the transfer can occur. So by putting this block into place, this lockbox, they could not send those files to the, uh, the home in question, nor could, it was called the Lynn, it's now HCSS or something like that. Right. Um, they couldn't act either because that was given, that lockbox order was given to both. Hmm. Interesting. Well, certainly it probably created too much trouble for the system as a whole to deal with. They just decided to acquiesce in the end. That's yeah, an interesting tactic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on to Sal had a question. Sal, could you unmute, please? I think you were muted when you asked the question. Yes, that's right. Uh, I was unmuted. I was muted. I'm sorry. I, I asked, what's the point of launching class action lawsuits when government appeals them? And uh, especially if it doesn't like them. And uh, e even if it doesn't do that, it can always preempt them by using notwithstanding clauses. Well, it depends what your class action is. But first of all, we don't know if there's grounds for class action. I've, I've, I've put forward, is there sufficient evidence to justify one or not? I don't have the answer to that. What's the point of it if they appeal it? Well, uh, the point of it is that you're... You're advancing your case, and even if they do appeal it, you can you can you could win the appeal, right? Um, so, and if you want to see how class actions can be effective, you may recall the tainted blood scandal of several years ago, back in the '90s, where a multitude of class actions ultimately helped push the federal government into a, a program that uh, provided compensation for a tainted blood victims and 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 uh, there was an entire regime set up to 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 manage those claims so you, you know you got it and it's something like that you got to expect that it may very well be appealed if it's not going to get settled now your other point about the charter yes that is um that's a growing problem because of course the notwithstanding clause is there and it can be invoked uh and then your charter argument goes down the tubes so I hear you about that one. I'm not sure if it's going to be charter based, you could be up the creek without a paddle. Yeah, that was my understanding as well, that there's all kinds of problems around the charter. So, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't go forward or there shouldn't be an attempt. So um, can I ask you a quick one, Sam? Sure. Uh, does the person who is forced into a dangerous situation in long-term care have to still be alive? Um, or can you use their records and, and what has transpired to bring a case anyway? Uh, the estate can, can bring a case, absolutely. Wrongful okay. death. If, if, okay, and is there, a, is there a time period by which- Yeah, have there, is, there is. There's a, the general limitation period is two years from the date you knew or ought to have known you had a claim. Okay, that's useful because there is a case where somebody was forced into Orchard Villa in full outbreak. And, 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 and Orchard Villa was one of the homes mentioned in the military report. Yes, I saw that. And, and yeah. it's got to be getting close to two years. Now, it's interesting, during COVID, because of COVID, the limitation period was extended when the courts were not really functioning. So it's actually a little bit more than two years based on that extension of that, okay. that was given. So you'd really want to watch your, keep your eye on the time limit on that one yeah. if, if there were a real interest in pursuing that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, the other quickie, just a comment, discharge planners. I don't know whether at the in the hospitals, I don't know whether or not they're required to know where they're sending people. Um, 
it would be a quick even look at an inspection report, but I think you'd be useful if the if the home is out under is out of compliance on serious issues, I would think there would be a duty on that discharge planner to at least know that much. I know in the community, when discharge planners refer to agencies or organizations, there is some duty for them to actually know what the situation is at the agency that they're referring people to. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering whether something similar exists for discharge planners in hospitals. And that's exactly the kind of evidence we have, we'd have we have to look into if this were to be pursued. What's, what is the process? What is the mechanism? Are there any safeguards in it? Do they actually in fact check the home before they make the referral? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question from Helen Lee. Helen, did you wanna ask your question? You'll need to unmute. I don't have a question, I don't think. Or, oh, is my, because, or is my memory failing me? I think I think I think you are. I think you may not may be not be asking. Oops, I Oops, have, I have, oh, I was oh. answering that question about oh. the <laughs> the class action suit. Like, if you have the class action suit, like Orchard Villa, right? They may not be as quick in renewing their license. Like, it wouldn't be like they might kind of linger a bit longer extended i'm not sure what's happening with orchard villa now i i've been out of the loop okay i think uh, doug you had a question um just to finish up yeah thanks trish uh sam thanks for today it was, it was great i i'm i want to ask a question about uh, the coercion of people into more restrictive environments and uh, coercion occurs, for example, there's been a lot recently said about um, if you do not give people the support they need in, to live in community, for example, people with disabilities, um, then people with disabilities may well choose uh, to end their life through uh, MAID. And so there's I a, saw that. Mm -hmm. the course of element. So the same thing with long-term care. If you do not give people the support they require to live in community, you are coercing them into uh, what the U.S. courts have called a uh, most restrictive environment, while the law favors least restrictive environment. And I, I wonder if you have any comments on, on, on the lack of uh, supports in our community to help people age where they would like to age and at home and in community. And is that a coercive element in some ways that can be addressed by some um, legal remedies? Yeah, that's a tough one because you really, there's no legal tool to force a government to adopt a certain policy. But as I said earlier, you can't sue a government for bad policy. You can only really sue them when they operationalize their decisions in a negligent manner. So, um, the, you know, I think the bigger coercion is, you know, I talked about the invisible hand. Well, when, you, when the hospital is telling you to get out, uh, they have a very visible hand on your financial throat, right? <laughs> So th that's a more direct, that's a more um, uh, concrete example of coercion, but it's still part of the entire uh, picture, if you will, in a given case. So I couldn't attack the policy, but you know, as a, as a lawyer, but but you could certainly paint the paint the context for a court to to try to argue that in a specific case, the coercion is multifaceted, where the element of coercion is is relevant to your case. So. I'm not discounting it entirely, but uh, you know, you, the bottom line is you can't force a government, <laughs> a democratically elected government, to, to to adopt the policies you like. You can only do that by voting for a party that will, you know, do what you want them to do, and hopefully they'll follow through. Okay, this is the absolute last question, Mary Kelly, <laughs> and then then we'll end it. Mary's got her hand up. Mary C. Kelly. Okay, it doesn't look like Mary C. Kelly is there. So we're just going to wind it up in that case. Um, Sam, I want to thank you so much because, you know, so often we run into situations where all lawyers seem to think that seniors are interested in his wills and guardianship and they're not interested in having their constitutional rights enforced or in not being forced into situations 
Um, it, it's just, it's a horrible situation for older people. And there's been very little interest by lawyers to take on cases. Um, and that includes legal clinics have been unwilling to take on the cases. They just seem to feel that they don't have the resources or they, they don't have the knowledge and they just haven't taken things forward. So we really do appreciate your very creative look at all of this and all the possible ways that some of this, um, some of these issues could actually be addressed through all different areas of law. So I know you did a lot of work on this. You must have. And we really are very grateful. So thank you very much for doing this today. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I see people applauding. Oh, thank and, you. <laughs> yeah, and people are saying thank you on chat. So be sure to have a look at the chat. Um, okay. What we are going to do is um, we are going to put this session up on our YouTube channel. So everybody go and have a look at the YouTube channel if you want to review anything that was in the session. And while you're there, would you subscribe just so that uh, you're letting people know that you're subscribing to SSAO's YouTube channel. There's no money involved, no hassle involved. You just hit the subscribe button. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>